to magnify the Lord with me. Magnify the Lord. to these words. Mm, mm, mm. Who can share the heart like Jesus? By his presence all divine, true and tender, pure and precious. Oh, how blessed to call him mine. Let's sing that together.
praise the Lord. Our affirmation of hope is taken from the front page of your bulletin, inside the top, and it may also be on the screen. We'll read it together. In the inside top in your bulletin. God, we glorify you because you are good. You love us, and your love inspires us to be a house of hope. Jesus, we celebrate you for being our savior. You've shown us you are care through your life and death, and your care inspires us to be a house of healing. Holy Spirit, we honor you for bringing comfort and direction. You reach one and all with your creative power, and your creativity inspires us to be a house that welcomes all. Within this place, there's an atmosphere of hope, and we will worship. Within this place, there is an atmosphere of healing, and we will grow. Within this house, we are a family, and when we leave this place, we carry the message of hope and healing to others. For the glory of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you're giving us another opportunity to come together and worship you. We thank you for the opportunity to lift up the name of Jesus how great you've been in our lives. We pray that you would continue to stir up your spirit within us, and may we be blessed and be a blessing to others by what you do in our lives this day. We thank you for our visitors. We pray that you would bless them equally, Lord. We love you, Father, and we just pray for a great outpouring of your spirit. Be with the speaker of the hour, and let us remember that you are speaking through them to us, and we will take that message and we will share it with the world. We love you, Father. In Jesus' name, we do praise you. Praise and honor you this day. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Elder Wortham just said, thank you, God, for our visitors. Who are our visitors today? Are there any visitors here with us? If so, let's see you wave your hand and put it high in the air. Ooh! Now I need all the brave visitors to stand up. Any of our brave visitors who are happy to be in the house of God to stand up. It's okay if you stay seated. You might be a little timid and shy. Some of us are that way, but that's all right. Welcome. Let's give them another round of applause. Welcome. So members, you see our visitors today. I need all of our members to make sure that at least four of you go out and greet our visitors. Bless you and thank you for coming today. Good morning online. As we sing, greet each other in Jesus' name. This is our time to move. Amen.
is Janelle, your girl. I am on North Capitol Street with our Capitol looking at us right behind. Hey, I am here with a very, very important message. V-O-T-E, that is a way to be, thing to do. Okay, whatever it is, vote. How many of you had a chance to go out before November 1st to vote? It is okay if you didn't. Don't feel ashamed because you have one more chance. You have one more shot. Tuesday, November 6th is the opportunity for everyone to get out there and vote. Now, what day did I say? Tuesday, November 6th. Listen, it is not the time to sit back and be passive. It is not the time to just pray. It is the time to pray and move and to do our God-given right to make our voices heard. Tuesday, November 6th, vote. Thank you, Janelle. I plan on voting and posting about it on at Brinklow SDA. Hey, if you voted, shout it out and tag at Brinklow SDA. We want to share your civic stories too. Well, happy Sabbath, Brinklow family. It is November the 3rd, and we have just a few announcements for you today. Our Bible Bowl teams are set. Our 2018-2019 teams are ready, but we need just a few more youth and young adults to complete our teams. So if you are interested, please see Nico Giti immediately after service, right in Will's Chapel Hall. We look forward to making this another year where we shout, Brink Low, you know, with the trophy in hand. Then next Sabbath, don't miss Tacoma Academy's drama performance of the play, Fast Food. That is November 10 at 1015. That is Sabbath school time. And we want everybody to be here in the sanctuary as TA does this dramatic presentation. Right from this performance, I hope that you have your Pathfinder uniforms available no matter how snug it may be, because November the 10th is Pathfinder Adventurer Day. Start singing their songs in your head right now. The children and youth have done many things this year, and we are excited to hear so much about how they are Pathfinder Adventurer Strong. So please come out on November the 10th for Pathfinder Adventurer Day. Finally, it is second Sabbath next week, so after we have supported our Pathfinders and Adventurers, you will still have the opportunity to go out and support our Brinklow Cares initiative. If you would like to know what is available for next week, please see Dr. Yuva Shakes right in the lobby after service. Remember to always show that Brinklow cares. Well, family, these are your announcements. To see a full list of our announcements, please look in our church bulletin or church website. Or for highlights and events, check us out at Brinklow SDA on social media. Just a side note, I know your kids won't care about this, but parents, remember to roll back the clocks tonight so your kids can come into your room at 5 a.m. rather than 6 a.m. Yep. Well, church, this is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Lord in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty firmament, praise him for his mighty acts, praise him according to his excellent greatness, praise him with the sound of the trumpet, praise him with the lute and the harp, praise him with the timbrel and the dance, praise him with the stringed instruments and flutes, praise him with loud it didn't say quiet, did it? It says right here, it says loud symbols. And then everything that hath breath is supposed to what? It's supposed to praise the Lord. May I let you do the health minute before I go crazy up here? May I, am I allowed? All right, thank you. Thank you. Fire it up. Thank you. That's all right. I'll be right back. That's Happy Sabbath, Brinklow. I want you to consider the past 10 days in America with me. Wednesday, October 24th, a white male shot and killed two African Americans at a Kroger store in Kentucky after a failed attempt to barge into a black church. Then Thursday, October 25th, 
14 pipe bombs were mailed to Democratic lawmakers and celebrities. Then on Saturday, October 27th, a man opened fire in a Pittsburgh synagogue, killing 11 people. Those 72 hours in America have one thing in common, hate. Three hate-filled suspects, three hate-filled crimes, all occurring against a backdrop of midterm elections on Tuesday and social divisiveness that is causing about 59% of Americans to say they are stressed. This morning, I want to talk to you about stress in America. This past week, October 30th, the American Psychological Association revealed a survey, and the survey shows a common new source of significant stress. You want to know what that is? Politics-induced stress. Politics-induced stress. The survey actually shows that one in six Americans have work-strained relationships because of political discussions. People are getting into arguments with family members and friends, feeling short-tempered and argumentative. Some people are feeling hopeless about the future. Now, the symptoms of stress certainly can vary from person to person, but they often include a combination of either emotional or physical reaction. So the emotional reaction could be tension or worry. Physical could be headache or stomach problems. But the results of the survey really draw attention to the serious physical and emotional implications of stress and the inextricable link between mind and body. So mental health professionals around the country are noticing there's an upward trend of patients with anxiety and depression related to the politics of the day. One psychologist even reported that she is seeing that most of her patients are not at peace, regardless of who they voted for. The uncertainty and unpredictability tied to the future of our nation is really affecting the health and well-being of many Americans in a way that psychologists are saying in the survey, it's pretty unique to this period in our nation's history. So I want you to take a look at some of the findings from the survey. Would you believe that a majority of Americans are saying they are more worried about the future of the nation than they are about money or work? That's how people, much people are stressed. And 57% of Americans, and this includes members of both political parties, they're saying they are more worried about the current political climate than they are about violence and crime. And more than half of Americans say that they believe that we are at our lowest point in our nation's history that they can remember. And this view is actually shared across generations from people who actually lived through World War II, the Vietnam War, Pearl Harbor, and even 9-11. So how can we manage this politics-induced stress? Well, you can see from this survey that most people choose to listen to music as a way to relieve stress or exercise. Only 29% of Americans use prayer to deal with stress. But I would say in this political climate, as a political scientist, I say there are two ways to relieve stress best. One, pray. Two, vote. Pray because scripture tells us in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Amen. The second thing that I believe we must do to relieve politics and do stress is vote. When you vote, you contribute to shaping the future of our nation. And when you vote, you take control of your destiny. And when you take control of your destiny, you certainly can control your politics, induce stress. I'm Dr. Herma Percy, and I approve this health message. Thank you.
I said, praise him in the sanctuary. <laughs> praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him. Oh. Let me, let me stop. Let me stop. Don't, don't encourage me. Don't encourage me. Don't encourage me. Thank you, Dr. Herman Percy, for that wonderful message to us this morning. I don't know about you. I'm a little, I'm a little verklempt over the crazy. I'm a little bothered by it. And it bears noting that God has an antidote for us, does he not? Yes. Amen. You may have noticed in your bulletin a little insert, preparing for the armed intruder. Can you believe you have to put that in a church bulletin today? Yes. The Emmanuel Brinklow Church takes that concern very seriously. I want you to review that. Take a look at it. We have been in a process of preparing our church for hopefully never having to deal with that eventuality, but it is a reality and we don't want to ignore it. Amen? Amen. Today, I want to recognize a couple of quick things. One, Elder Fred Thomas, he told me he, was, he, was, he turned 49 this week. That's what he told me. I don't know why he's lying in church, but that's what he told me. But if you flip, if you flip those two numbers, you'd get to where Elder Thomas is. Elder Fred, turn, stand up. We're going to sing to you today in the name of Jesus. 94 years young. Amen. Come on, sing with me, y'all. Day to you. Happy birthday to you. Come on. Happy birthday, Elder Thomas. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Man, I want to be 94 someday. Come on now. Takes a, listen, it takes a while to get there. You got to work on it. And you got to live right. I think what I love about Elder Thomas is that there's so much right living behind the years. Praise the Lord for that. I want to also alert your attention that for the next three Sabbaths, this Sabbath included, the clerks are in the foyer and they're validating our church directory. So if you can, when you come in, if you would just stop by, you're a member of the Emmanuel Brinklow Church, would you mind just stopping by the desk out there so that they can finish their work and we can get you included, get all your right information so that uh, the directory will be accurate. Don't want you to forget that. Also today, we have a couple of folks who are experiencing some challenges. Sister Wanda Perkins, uh, her mother is in the hospital. I want you to remember Sister Perkins in your prayer, please, at this time. And Sister Deborah Otley funeralized her mother last week, and we want to remember that family as well. Continue to pray for them. You know, it's after the funeral and after it's over that people often suffer when everybody goes home. So we don't want to forget our dear members who may be enduring some challenges at this time. Um, today is the kicks off the 27th annual Emmanuel Brinklow Cotillion Botillion. Do we have any young people, not so young people here who are alumni of that event? You've been through it. Do I see some hands around here? Sponsors? Have you served as a sponsor? Anybody been a sponsor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, are your pockets a little lighter because you have supported the ministry of this wonderful event? I want to ask Jackie Prelo Johnson to come forward at this time for a very special presentation. Good morning. I'm a selfishly say that this is probably my best Sabbath of the year. <laughs> Today we will introduce to you 20 debutantes and bows that will comprise our 2018 and 2019 La Elegance Cotillion Botillion. As Pastor Esmond mentioned, 27 years ago, the La Elegance Cotillion Botillion was founded here at Emmanuel Brinklow to provide a program for college-bound high school seniors with three major goals in mind to engage the participants in spiritual and educational workshops, recreational and cultural activities, as well as the participation in a community service project. 
to assist the participants in raising scholarship money for their higher education and to debut the participants at a formal event which concludes our program year. And again, my name is Jackie Prelo Johnson. I serve as the program director, and I am privileged to work with a dedicated team. At this time, I'm gonna ask my team to stand as I introduce their names. So we're gonna start with Nadia Chevalier, Haley Seymour, and Letty Cephas, who are our finance coordinators, Ms. Terry Barnes, our parent coordinator, Milan Medley, who's not with us today, is our communications direct communicator. Nadia Kennedy, our junior debutante and bow coordinator. Joanne Burroughs, our souvenir journal coordinator. Jackie Bethea, our sponsor coordinator, who couldn't be with us. Doreen Hines and Barbara Howard are our seating and tickets coordinators. Ayana Dancy, our activities coordinator. Mr. Warren Banfield, I see you in the back, and Barbara Howard are our treasury team, and Ms. Debbie Dudley is on our dress approval committee. Please join me in thanking them for their dedication to our program. The committee would like to thank you, the members of Emmanuel Brinklow and our sister churches for your support to past participants and we solicit your continued commitment to higher education. We invite you to come and celebrate our seniors at the formal event, which will be held on Sunday, April 14th of 2019 at 1 p.m. at the hotel on the campus of the University of Maryland in College Park. We are excited, we have a new venue, so please join us. To purchase tickets and to make your donations to our Debs and Bows, you will visit www.laelegance.org to make your donations and purchase tickets. And also, if you would like to consider please giving a tax-free donation to the committee to enable us to continue to provide a superb program for our participants, for that donation, you may contact Warren, Barbara, or myself. No donation is too small or too large. This morning, Pastor Medley, Anthony Medley, our senior pastor, would have loved to have been here with us, but he had to leave for a prior commitment. So after the introductions this morning, Pastor Dwayne Esmond, who's our relational ministries pastor, will offer a prayer of dedication. Unfortunately, several of our participants could not be with us this morning because of a, a prior school commitment. So I'm going to introduce those for you. First, we have Takara Lene Banks. Takara is a senior at Tacoma Academy. She attends the Restoration Praise Center. Her parents are Todrick and Avia Banks and her sponsor is Mrs. Jewel Walwyn. Are the parents of sponsors present? Next, we have Taylor James Beckford. He attends Mountain View High School. He's a senior at Mountain View High School. He attends the Capitol Hill Seventh-day Adventist Church. His parents are Hugh Beckford and Mrs. Sherman Donovan Beckford, and his sponsor is Mac Maurice. Are the parents or sponsor here? Thank you, welcome. Robert Winston Booker II. He's a senior at Tacoma Academy. He attends Capitol Hill Seventh-day Adventist Church. His parents are Robert Booker and Mrs. Diane Wallace Booker. His sponsor is Daryl Smith. Imani Patrice Hembre, she attends, or she's a senior at Tacoma Academy. She attends Capitol Hill Seventh-day Adventist Church. Her parents are Greg and Tanisha Hembre, and her sponsor is Mrs. Darlene Henry. Stefan Shane Laurie, he is a senior at Tacoma Academy. He attends the Emmanuel Brinklow SDA Church. 
His parents are Darnell Laurie and Antoinette Percy Laurie, and his sponsor is Mr. Ernest Janelles. May you please stand? <laughs> Ms. Asia Rigby. Asia is a senior at Tacoma Academy. She attends the first Seventh-day Adventist Church of Washington, D.C. Her parents are Raiden and Lydia Rigby, and her sponsor is Carrie Hines. Are you present? Thank you. Oh, she's here. Oh. So at this time, the participants will come forward. Good morning, church. My name is Lauren Sanso. I am a senior at Mead High School. I attend Capitol Hill Seventh day Adventist Church. My parents are Jack and Cheryl Sanso, and my sponsor is Cherie Brown. May you please stand. Good morning and happy Sabbath, for, uh, church. My name is Asia Rigby. I'm a senior at Tacoma Academy. I attend the First Seventh-day Adventist Church of Washington, D.C. My parents are Radon and Lydia Rigby, and my sponsor is Mrs. Carrie Hines. Will you all please stand? Uh, good morning and happy Sabbath. My name is Carson McCoy. I'm a senior at Longreach High School. I attend Emmanuel Brinklow Church. My parents are uh, Alan and April McCoy, and my sponsor is Mr. Philip Burroughs. Will y'all please sing? Good morning, happy Sabbath. My name is Elizabeth Reed. I'm a senior at Alpha Omega Academy. I attend First Church. My parent is Lisa Reed. My sponsor is Echo Bathray. Will my sponsor please stand? Good morning, church family. My name is Darren Caleb. I am a senior at Tacoma Academy. I am a proud member of the Emmanuel Brinkley Seventh-day Adventist Church. My parents are Don and Darrell Caleb, and my sponsor is Pastor Dwayne Esmond. Please stand. Our good morning, church. My name is Bradley Marshall. I'm a senior at Tacoma Academy. I attend the Sligo Seventh-day Adventist Church. My parents are Michelle and Archie Marshall, and my sponsor is Dr. Dale Barnes. Parents, will you, stay, will you please stand? Happy Sabbath, church. Uh, my name is Aaron Herwood. I am a senior at Springfield High School. I attend the Ephesus Seventh-day Adventist Church in New York. My parents are doctors Andrew and Karen Herwood. My sponsor is Darnell Thomas, who is not present today, but uh, I would like to ask my Aunt Mary to please stand, represent, <laughs> and my mother. Good morning, church. My name is Maya Robinson. I am a senior at Milford Mill Academy. My parents are Treva Robinson and Norman Robinson, and my sponsor is Onika Brown. May my parent please stand. Good morning, my name is Brandon Lake Denny. Uh, I'm a senior at Friendly High School. I go to Breath of Life. My parent is Sheila Patterson Denny, and my sponsor is Russell. Uh, so could you stand? Good morning, happy Sabbath church. My name is Nalani Siobhan Phillips. I am a senior at James Hubert Blake High School. My parents are Paula and Sterling Phillips, and I attend Emmanuel Brinklow Seventh Day Adventist Church. My sponsor is Sandra Brown. Will you please stand? 
Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. My name is Abby Charles. I am a senior at Milford Mill Academy. I attend Liberty Church. My parents are Will and Eveline Charles, and my sponsor is Martine Charles. Can you please stand? Good morning and happy Sabbath. My name is Amir Willis Jones. Um, I'm a senior at James Huber Blake High School, and I attend Restoration Praise Center. My parents are Ramon, Ramon Jones and Faith McKenzie, and my sponsor is Kenrick Wellwin. Can you please stand? Um, good morning and happy Sabbath Church. My name is Jordan Davis. I am a senior at Tacoma Academy. I attend Brinklow Seventh-day Adventist Church. My parents are Kayla Ragland and Brent Davis. My sponsor is Faith Davis. Mom, can you please stand? Good morning and happy Sabbath. My name is Gabrielle Dreyer. I am a senior at Alpha Omega Academy. I attend the First Seventh-day Adventist Church. My parents are LaShonda Dreyer and Uriah Dreyer, and my sponsor is Laverne Reed. Can my parent and sponsor please stand? And I introduced the incorrect Asia earlier. So Asia Watson is also a participant. Her parents are Alfred and Jewel Watson. She attends Tacoma Academy and a member of the Capitol Hill Seventh-day Adventist Church. So Asia Watson. Church, would you put your hands together one more time for our bows and Debs for this year? Thank God for them. And we need to give them to God. They already belong to him. We're just entrusted as parents and guardians. Would you bow with me as we pray? Gracious, loving, heavenly Father, we thank you for the Holy Sabbath day. We thank you, Lord, when we could come aside and witness a scene like we're witnessing now. Young, strong, young people. They're bright, they're wise. They have so much ahead of them. Standing on this stage, Lord, is unlimited potential. Dreams and visions embodied in young bodies. Standing on this stage is the input of parents who have paid and sacrificed and suffered. Standing on this stage are young people created in your image and for your glory. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you will cover them with your righteousness. Lord, I pray that after the cotillion is over and after they stand and they are well dressed and everybody showers the accolades on them, I pray that their hearts would be inclined to you. That when you speak, they answer. That when you move them, they move. I pray that they will be so sensitive to your Holy Spirit that when he whispers, it will sound like a shout. I pray, Holy Father, for them intellectually. They've been given gifts and talents, and they're not meant to be hidden. They're meant to be developed. So I pray that they will apply themselves in their studies and in their effort, and remember that the highest education is that which they know of God. So steep them, Lord, in your word and in their academics. I pray for, Lord, that you will bless their families and their loved ones and the churches and the community that surrounds them. We ask, Father, that if they should fall, that they will fall into a community that loves them. That if they make mistakes, we won't throw them away. That if they do something, Lord, that is against your will, that, that we will take our cue from you. For if you could forgive us, adults out here who won't tell our story, I pray that we will love them enough to let them get up and keep walking until they walk right into your kingdom. In the mighty name of Jesus, we dedicate the fruit of our bodies to you this morning. In Jesus' name, let the church say, amen. Amen. Young people, God bless you. God bless you. Put your hands together, church, one more time for these special, special young people. The Bible says, I called you, young man, because you're strong. 
young women as well. At this time, I want to ask Elder Jeff Brown if he would come forward. We are blessed today with many special guests in our midst, and I want to ask uh, Pastor Brown if he would specially welcome them. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. My name is Jeffrey Brown. I am a junior. Uh, that is to say, junior pastor at the Emmanuel Brinklow Seventh-day Adventist Church. My parents are not here um, this morning, but I'm so glad, as Pastor said, that we have some wonderful guests who are here, um, and there are many here for the North American Division um, year-end meetings. Uh, we have with us uh, the Vice President of Central States Conference, Pastor Kristen Joseph. Pastor, could you please uh, stand? Please let us give him a hearty amen, all the way from Kansas. And then we have what I would call a Bermudian invasion. Uh, we have, leading the charge, the president of the Bermuda Conference, recently re-elected for four more years, <laughs> Dr. Kenneth and Sister Claudette Manders. Uh, Dr. Manders, let's give them a hearty amen. We are also honored to have the newly elected Director of Education for the Bermuda Conference, Sister Rosemary Tyrrell. Sister Tyrrell, please stand. Sister Tyrrell. And uh, her sister, Joy, who is also here. Joy, please stand. They are sisters of uh, one of our own members who has moved away now, Sister Gail uh, Myrie, that many of us know. So we are so honored to have them. And we have finally Sister Deborah Jilks and her husband Tony and their 10-year-old uh, granddaughter, Kaylin. Please stand. Thank you. Are there any others who are here for those meetings? Well, we certainly wish you God's blessing and we are honored that you have chosen the Brinklow Seventh-day Adventist Church for your Sabbath experience. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice. I said we will rejoice and be glad in it. May God bless you. This time I want to call forward Sister Valeria Desard from our Women's Ministry Department for a special presentation. Good morning, church family. A little while back, we honored Odessa Bryant. I don't know how many of you were here. Well, we had two ladies we were supposed to honor, but the... Um, the one lady was not present that day. She uh, actually happens to be working on her terminal degree. So she will be joining a lot of other members. Um, I would like to call Marlene Roberts, please. Would all friends of Marlene please stand at this time? Marlene has been in the back hounding us. She's in charge of, you know, the floor. Um, she came out to the lobby and said, who's doing this women's ministries? Are you doing it? I said, oh, yes. She said, well, you need to be in the back. I said, okay, I'm coming. Okay, so Marlene, the women's ministries committee chose you as a woman of Brinklow. Servant leader. So I have a long list of items to read. I'll go as fast as I can. Marlene has been a health fair worker, head usher, church media. Remember, she made copies of those DVDs and kept up with them. We had to pay, I think, $2, and we got our DVDs from her. 
She set up the first food bank on Wednesday nights. Remember that? Um, after prayer meeting, people could get food. Pathfinder instructor, sang in the church choirs, worked in cradle roll out in the trailers. That was before my time. Um, before this sanctuary was built. Also worked in the primary, junior, and early teen. Outreach programs with dental hygiene. Worked with Christian education programs. Set up payment for tuition so that students could take their exams. Caterer for church activities. Excellent caterer, FYI. Community service leader. Made vests for the jewels for Jesus. Made baptismal rolls, robes, com uh, communion table coverings. Provided janitorial services for Brinklow. One of her friends said to me, I used to help her on, on uh, Saturday nights, but she worked me too hard and I quit. She uh, has been a mentor for youth and young adults. She's actually done everything except pastor at the church. <laughs> so Marlene, we would like you to know that the women of Brinklow appreciate and love you. And this is a small token of our love and esteem for you. I'm, I'm going to say a quick word because, you know, we're taking up too much time. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I've been a member of Brinklow for about 35, 35, 36 years. Um, and during that time, I've enjoyed my tenure here. Uh, it's been a joy and a pleasure to work in the vineyard because that's what I see it as, working in the vineyard. It's not about me, it's about the person sitting next to me, the person sitting behind me, the person sitting in front of me. That's what it's about. It's about being a committee of one, because when you see a need, you need to step in and try to fill that need and just do the work of the Lord. That's all I've been doing. I've been trying to fulfill what my mother instilled in me years ago, um, and I've enjoyed doing it. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, our services will continue as outlined in your bulletin. I know it's been a lot of commercials this morning, but you ought to wait for the word that is going to come from the Lord. I got a preview at early service. Strap in and pray for our speaker. Amen. God bless you. and girls. Okay, there are thousands of you up here this morning. Good morning, boys and girls. It is so wonderful to see all of you who are here this morning. So we have someone collecting our offering. Very good. 
How many of you are in school this week? You went to school this week? Did you have a good week at school? Yes, school is always good. That's where you learn lots of things, right? Okay, so I need you to be really quiet, really quiet. Our story today is about a young man named Peter, and he had a son. They lived in a small town, and he had a son named Michael. This is Michael. Can you say hello, Michael? Yes, so he had a son named Michael. Michael would go to school just like all of you, but he would hear the boys and girls talking about different things that they had. Now, Peter, his dad, was not very rich. They lived in a small town, a small house. He worked hard, but just enough to take care of his family. So one day, Michael said to his dad, Peter, Dad, I hear everybody talking about how they have a laptop. I want a laptop. And so Dad, he loved Michael so much, he said, I'm going to try and get Michael a laptop. But I don't have enough money. Oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the rich part of town, and I'm going to rob a house. So Peter decides that that's what he's going to do. He is going to go to the rich side of town and rob a house. So Peter comes, and Peter decides that I am going to, oh, there's Peter coming. He decides that he is going to rob a house. And so he looks into the window, and he sees that they're having a party. And so the, all the people in the house are dancing, the music is playing, and so Peter looks in and he waits a little bit, and then the party is over. And Peter decides, I'm going to go inside, and I'm going to take a few things and just take a few things and put it in my bag, and then I'm going to go and sell them so I can get this laptop. So that's what Peter does. He runs out and he takes all the things that he has and guess what he does? He buys Michael a laptop and he runs home to Michael. Peter runs home to Michael. <laughs> and he says, Michael, look, he can't get through. <laughs> he said, Michael, look what I have for you. A laptop! Yay! And so he was so happy. But then Michael says, Dad, I heard them talking about Jordan shoes. I need Jordan shoes. And so Dad says, oh my gosh, I've got to rob the house again. So he runs out, and he runs as fast as he could. <laughs> and he decides, I am going to rob another house. And so he comes back out quickly, and he decides that he is going to rob a house. Now, in this house, boys and girls, guess what they were doing? Do you have brothers and sisters? Well, they were fighting. They were doing homework, and they were fighting over who should watch the TV, and they were just upset at each other, and then they turned off the lights, Peter went inside, and Peter took some stuff again, and then he ran quickly, <laughs> ran quickly, and he saw what he had, and then he came back, and he brought the Jordans to Michael, quickly brought the Jordans to Michael. <laughs> yes, he did. And here are the Jordans, and Michael, what do you say? Yay. <laughs> he was so excited that he, and then Michael says, Michael says, but dad, everybody has a cell phone. I need a cell phone. So Peter was like, oh my God, I am going to get caught. But he decides one more time that he was going to go quickly 
and decide that he was going to do this. So Peter comes back out. He finds another house. But guess what? At this house, they were having worship. And he heard the mother reading from a book. And the mom says, he was wounded for our transgressions, and he died for our iniquities. And Peter was so puzzled. Look at Peter's face. He couldn't, he says, what is this? Who was wounded? Who died? And after he said, I don't understand what they're talking about. And then the family knelt down, they prayed, they turned off the lights, and they went to bed. And that night, Peter said, I don't think I'm going to go into this house. So he turned away, and he decided, I'm not going to go into this house tonight. But all week, Peter was thinking, who was wounded? Who died? I don't understand what that lady was talking about. It bothered Peter so much. Guess what he did? He went to the lady's house, and he knocked on the door. And the lady opened the, the door, and she said, and Peter said, I just want to know who was wounded and who died. And he said, she said, that's right, Doreen. That's what she said. How did you know that? And he said, well, I was looking into the window. I was thinking to come in and rob you guys, but I just want to know who was wounded and who died. And do you know that lady brought Peter into the house and Peter started getting Bible studies. And do you know what he learned, boys and girls? He learned that Jesus loves him and that the Ten Commandments says, thou shalt not steal. What did the Ten Commandments say? Thou shalt not steal. He also learned that Jesus will provide. He doesn't have to steal. He doesn't have to do anything because whatever Michael wanted, Jesus would help him to find the way to get it. So guess what, boys and girls? If you go back to that town, do you know where you will find Peter? Peter? Do you know where you'll find him? Take a look. He is in the choir, singing. Stand up, Peter. So boys and girls, remember this. Thank you, Peter. So boys and girls, remember this. Jesus loves us. He wants us to obey his commandments. We never have to steal. Do we have to steal, boys and girls? No. We never have to steal because who takes care of us? Jesus does. So always remember that. Never take anything that doesn't belong to you. And remember that Jesus will provide for whatever you need. All right. I need a boy. Well, Michael's here already. So he's going to do one prayer for me. I need a young lady who's going to pray for me. Is there one young lady? Can you pray for us? Okay. So we have our two who are going to pray. Let's bow our heads. Can you pray? Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you that we get to come to church. Thank you that we get to learn more about you. Please help us to have a good rest of the day and help us to learn more about you. Amen. Amen. Dear Jesus, thank you for blessing us and giving us what we need. Thank you that we're here, all here today. Please let us learn to be good and help us have a good rest of our day. Amen. Amen. Thank you, boys and girls. You can go back to your seats.
crowd in the house this morning. Amen. The ushers are asking if there is a seat next to you, please raise your hand. If anyone has an extra seat beside them, please raise your hand. Amen. We want to make sure everyone gets a chance to hear the word of God this morning. Amen. That was a good story. Amen. Thou shalt not steal what a man robbed God. Why don't Tom, Sister Barnes, would the deacons please come forward as we receive this morning's tithe and offering. And as they do, I must recognize again, Pastor Josiah, Central States Conference. That's my home conference, so it's always good to see someone from Kansas City. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, Lord. We come before you this morning just to give thanks for what you have done for us, what you're doing for us, and what you will do. As we return what you've given to us, we ask that you will bless it and multiply it tenfold. In Jesus' name we ask, amen.
in prayer. There's salvation in prayer. Lord, there is peace in prayer. The Bible says all who are burdened and heavy laden, come unto me and I will give you rest. Isn't God good? But there's someone this morning with a burden on your heart, a concern for a friend or a loved one, or something that's been on your mind for years, and you want to come a little bit closer to the altar, we ask you to come forward at this time. We invite the Holy Spirit in this place. And whatever cares you may have, whatever concerns there may be, Whatever physical element you may have, it's not too hard for God. Amen? And at this time, if you want to come a little closer, we ask that you do. And those where you are, reverently build, bow your head or get on your knees as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, how excellent is thy name. We come before you because you're good, because you're worthy to be praised, because you woke us up this morning, clothed in our right mind, Father. We don't take it for granted, Lord. It's because of who you are, I can live to see tomorrow. The death on the cross gives us hope that when we pray in your son's name, they will be answered and our voice will be heard, Father. We wanna say thank you. So, Father, we lay these burdens at your feet this morning. Lord, burdens that I call intangible burdens, Father. Hatred, angry, vengeance. Lord, things that come and shape our character unchristlike, Lord. We lay it at your feet, Father. Jealousy, resentment, Lord. We cast it all at the feet of Jesus. And Father, then as those are physical concerns, fighting with cancer, Lord, those with heart problems, Lord, vision problems, struggler hearing, Lord, tumors, Lord, migraines that just won't stop, Father. We lay them all at your feet, Father. And Lord, then as those things, Lord, that we desire, that continues to be with us day after day after day, and we want to give it to thee. Depression, Father. Loneliness, Father. Being married and alone, Lord. Financial concerns. Addictions that we struggle with, Father. Lord, homosexuality that we can't overcome. Lord, you name it, it's among us here. And we are laid at your feet, Father. Lord, we still desire for great things to achieve in life. Lord, we want to be a great parent to our children, a great sister or brother to our siblings, Father, children to our parents, great parents to our children. We cannot do that without the Holy Spirit. So we call upon you this day. Father, as you saw the young people get up here, Lord, they look good, amen? And Father, we pray that you continue to guide them and direct them. Show them your love, your faith, your mercy, and anything they desire in life, if they call upon your name, you can deliver. And as the pastor said, if they fall short, let your mercy come before the commandments of law. Father, we thank you so much for that. And those among us, with those unspoken prayer requests, those they had never shared with anyone but you, Father, you hear their cry. You feel their pain. Father, you the strength when we are weak, Father. You the peace in the storm, Lord. Lord whatever else, anything in life we have, you are the provider and the deliverer. And Lord, we pray for the Perkins family, Father. The Otley family who lost a loved one. And Father, our pastor this morning. Lord, lift her up like never before. Give her a word that she didn't know she had, Father. A word that comes from you. And let us leave here refreshed, rejoiced, thankful we came to church this morning, Lord. And let us leave here changed. Let all our pain, our burdens at your feet and believing in the name of Jesus. 
And Father, be with thy young people every single step of the way. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we ask, amen and amen. today just feeling thankful every day we should be thankful but I really like this season I don't know everybody doesn't know me very well but I just like the season I like the holidays I like the joy I like the bustle I like connecting with family talking to friends I like gift giving and receiving if y'all want to know my cash app I'll share it um, <laughs> But I just enjoy this time of year. It gives us a special time to just reflect on how good God has been to us. So today is just a couple of songs that I chose, a little bit out of selfishness. These songs just make me feel good, makes me think of how good God is, and gives me a reason to praise Him. So join in and sing with us. And I think everybody knows all of these songs, so this shouldn't be hard.
that every day I get up, every single day I get up, from morning to night, I just praise him. I'm so thankful he forgives me. I'm so thankful he loves me. I'm so thankful he's still here with me. Hallelujah. Bless you, God.
In my day-to-day work, I work with people who are disabled and are elderly, and there's so much that they can't do. But I promise you, what they are able to do, I have a quadriplegic. For those who don't know, that means he pretty much can only talk. He was shot when he was in his 20s. Every time I see him, how you doing? God is good. Somebody has to change him every day, feed him, give him his medications, put the bag in and out. But when I ask him how he's doing, he says, God is good. I thank God for him because he reminds me of how I need to be every day. I can walk, I can talk, I can do all kinds of things. Nobody has to change my diaper. And yet sometimes we sit and we hold back yes. these praises. Yes. Our thankfulness gets us through. Our remembrance gets us over. Thank you, God. I love you, Lord. I love you. I love you, I love you, Lord, today, because you cared for me in such a special way, that's why I
you love the Lord? Do you love the Lord? Does your heart and soul belong to Him? I am going to ask you to stand to your feet as we read God's Word this morning. It's taken from the book of Matthew. We'll be spending most of our time in the book of Ezra, but the scripture reading is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 12, verses 44 to 46. When you have it, say amen. If you need a minute, say wait for me. Let's read together. Then he says, let me read from my iPad. When an evil spirit leaves a person, an evil spirit, it goes to dry and arid places. Then it goes and gets seven other evil spirits, more evil than itself. And it returns to where it came from and finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. So it fills it, and the state of that person is worse than when it first began. The title of our sermon is Let Me In. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I just, God, I just love you so much. I just love you. There is a group of people in the book of Ezra. The book of Ezra, Ezra, it it details a story and a history of the Israelites at a crucial point in a way like no other. They are in Babylon and the Bible tells us that there were two groups of people that made their way back from Babylon to Jerusalem. There were the ones who had, from a young age, seen their ancestors when they came up out of the land of Israel and and knew what the temple was like and knew what Jerusalem was like before they were banished into exile. And so they were taken at a very young age, no more than five or six or three or four, and they were brought and swept away into Babylon. And they spent their years, about 70 years or so, growing up in Babylon. And then you have those who who weren't teenagers, who weren't uh, little kids, who weren't elementaries, who who left Babylon, but there are those that who were born in Babylon, were raised in Babylon, and only knew Babylon. They they were Jewish in their bloodline. They they had Semitic roots, roots, but they talked like Babylonians and they walked like Babylonians, and they were tatted up like Babylonians, and they they wore jewelry like the Babylonians, but, but they didn't forget their Semitic roots. And so the Bible tells us that by the time we get to the book of Ezra, that these two groups of people, this, this intergenerational mix right here, you had the ones who knew of their past, their, of their ancestors' history, who had, who had come and had spent time living in Babylon, and then those who were born. And this group, this group that was born in Babylon, raised in Babylon, was represented by a man named Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel's name literally means the seed of Babylon. That he is he who is planted in Babylon. And so this man, Zerubbabel, he, he, he gets the courage to, to, go to, the, to go to the king. And the, the Bible says that God stirred up King Cyrus's heart and, and that he allowed the people to go. And, and so he, the people of God began to make their way up out of the land of Babylon and they headed towards Jerusalem, led by this man named Zerubbabel. So they're making their way to Jerusalem. They get to Jerusalem. They arrive there, and this people group, this this intergenerational mix, are we together? This intergenerational mix, they arrive back in Jerusalem. They say, we don't ever want to go into exile again. So let us do the things that our ancestors failed to do. Let us, let us do the ordinances that have been spoken about in the law. And so the first thing that they do when they get back to Jerusalem is they erect the altar of the Lord. 
They're like, we're going to put back the altar of the Lord where, where it was, and we're going to start offering offerings on it. And, and so they begin to offer our offerings on it. Now, you have to understand, this group of people, they, 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 they were zealous. They were determined to start doing things right, to, to get it together. And so they, they erect the altar of the Lord, and they're like, we're offering morning offerings on it. We're offering, offering evenings offering on it. Even we have a snack we're offering. We're doing offerings at every time. We are covering all of our bases. We don't want any sin to not be covered. Would you say amen? amen. And so they're doing all these offerings and, and then they look at the sky and they look at the stars and they say, oh my goodness, we, we, we almost missed the date. Um, it's the time to celebrate the festival of booths. And so they say, no man go to his house, no woman go to her courtyard, but we're gonna dwell in tents like our ancestors. And so they erect tents and they build shelters and they build booths because they want to keep the festival of Sukkoth, which is a festival of booths. So they're keeping the ordinance of the Lord and, and then they recognize that it's a new moon. And so they're like, we want to celebrate the new moon. We want to keep all of the law that was given to our ancestors exactly the way we should and the way that our ancestors failed. They wanted to get it right. They didn't want to go back into exile. They're like, we recognize where they went wrong and we're going to do it right. And so they begin to do all these things. Welcome, Pastor Medley. They begin to do all these things. They got it right, Pastor. They showed up on time for church. All right. He, he was on time. He was on time. He was on time. Your pastor's a busy man. Your pastor's a busy man. Always working for the Lord. They wanted to get it right. They were like, we are not messing this thing up again. We are not going back into exile. Offerings are going. They're dwelling in booths. They're worshiping God day and night. They're doing everything right. And then they say to themselves, okay, we've got the altar, we've got the offerings, we're, we're keeping the celebration of the new moon, we're, we're dwelling in booze, we're doing all the law according to our ancestors. And, and now what we want to do is we want to come together and we want to rebuild the temple on its original site exactly the way it was supposed to be. So the Bible says that they come together and they're unified in one purpose. They come together, this intergenerational group of people who can't usually get along, they come together for one unified purpose to build the temple of the Lord, amen? They come together, they, they, they begin to lay the foundation and put things in place and, and then they do the, the prayer of dedication. Now, when we hear these words in the book of Ezra, Ezra is calling our minds back to a certain time. When we read this story, our minds should drift back to Leviticus 9 when it says that the people all gathered together. They were consecrated. They were together on one purpose. They laid the foundation of the Lord. They offered up offerings. They did the prayer of dedication and boom, fire fell from the sky and the cloud, the Shekinah glory came down and filled the most holy place. It was lit from heaven. Then when we get to Solomon's time in, in 2, Corinthians, 2 Chronicles 7 verse 9, it says that Solomon gathered the people together. They were all consecrated. They laid the foundation for the temple's building. They offered the offerings. They consecrated the people. They did a prayer of dedication and boom, fire fell from the sky and lit the altar. And then the, the glory of God came down like a cloud and filled the most holy place. This is what took place. Time after time after time again, when they laid the foundation of the Lord, they did the prayer of dedication, they consecrated the people, they were all gathered together on one purpose, fire fell and the cloud filled the most holy place. So now you have us in the book of Ezra and the people are all gathered together on the Lord's day and they consecrated themselves and they laid the foundation for the Lord's temple and they did the prayer of, of offering and dedication and nothing happened. Fire did not fall. The cloud did not come down. Now, what I want you to understand is, it looks like the glory of the Lord had departed from Israel. Hello? So nothing happened. It's like, it's like my dad, he sometimes he would, he would call me from home and God bless his heart. And he would say, Chantel, the TV's not turning on. And I would say, dad, hit the green button. Hit the red button on the other remote. Make sure it's plugged in. Fire will fall. The cloud will fill the temple. And my dad's like, I did it, I did it, but it's not working. Something was not working. The algorithm did not work. They hit the code on their iPhone and it did not unlock. Something went wrong. What went wrong? What happened? Why did this reformation fail? Why did this revival not succeed? Fire did not fall. 
The altar was not filled with the presence of God. Something happened. What was it? Now what I want you to understand is when this didn't happen, when fire didn't fall and the cloud didn't come down and fill the temple the way it was supposed to, it elicited two different reactions from the intergenerational group standing there. The younger generation, those that were tatted up and who walked like Babylonians and talked like Babylonians but had the blood of Israel in the coursing through their veins. Those people, they sang a song to God. They were like, we are gonna worship him. We are gonna bless his name. The Lord's love endures forever. You are faithful. You are awesome. There is none like you, God. And it was on repeat. Over and over and over. They were a praise and worship generation. They sang until they couldn't sing no more. They worshiped until they couldn't worship no more. And it didn't matter what you looked like. They were happy. They were like, look what we've accomplished. We have built the temple of the Lord. We, look at this, look at this, this is awesome. This is amazing. And they sang a song to God. Adulation. And then on the other side, the elders and the Levites that remembered the glory of the Lord from when they were younger began to weep loudly. And they said, it doesn't look like the way it looked like before. It, it doesn't seem right. Why, how are they still wearing their jewelry while singing up front and, 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 and jumping around up front on stage? There's nothing new under the sun, hello? And so they said, we took off our earrings and we took off our necklaces and melted it down in service to build the temple of the Lord. This is not the temple of God. It did not look like God. It did not smell like God. It did not feel like God. And so they were upset. And the Bible says the weeping was so loud and the wailing was so loud and the worship was so loud that it could be heard at a distance, but nobody could decipher between the sound of worship and the sound of weeping. Intergenerational churches intergenerational ministry. And so the people of God are weeping and, and they wanted to go back. They, they didn't like the way it felt or way it, 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 it looked or the way it, it appeared and, and they couldn't figure out why, why God's glory hadn't come down and why there wasn't fire falling from the sky. And here's the kicker, God was with the people. God was the one who stirred up King Cyrus' heart and said, send my people back, let my people go. He was the one who brought the people together and unified them on one purpose and on one accord to build the temple of God. But it didn't look like the way it looked like back then. And so they had a problem with it. In fact, some of them said, Dwayne, some of them said, Pastor Brown, maybe we should, in protest, dress up like our ancestors. Some of them said, let us grow beards like Moses and protest against the way this younger generation is doing church. <laughs> and this, Brinklow, is the danger of always appealing to the past for where we should be in the present. We will look, we will look in the ancient Near East and say, women couldn't serve in the tabernacle then. But guess what? Black men couldn't serve either. You had to be Jewish. And yes, there's discrepancy on who was black, who was, but a core, you had to have Jewish bloodline in you. And if you didn't have a Jewish bloodline, if it was not traceable, you couldn't serve. But we appeal to the, the former days to figure out what we should be doing now. Some of us even want to appeal to the first century church to say, well, what did they do? How did they handle women in leadership? How did they deal with race relations? And, 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 and I'm, sometimes I'm like, yes, maybe we should appeal to them. But the, the, but, but the thing that drives me crazy, Pastor Medley, is that I just wonder, I mean, have we not matured as a people of God? Do we have to look back to know where we're going. And, and, and if, okay, and uh, so, so let me just help you. Let me just bring it back to Adventism really quickly, okay? If you don't like what I'm saying, a, a founder of our church, a, an early pioneer in our church once wrote these words. She said, in every age, there is a new development of truth, a message of God to the people of that generation. The old truths are all essential. New truth is not independent of the old but an unfolding of it. It is only as the old truths are understood that we can comprehend the new. When Christ desired 
to open up his disciples the truth of his resurrection, he began at, at Moses and all the prophets and expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That's Luke 24, verse 27. And then she goes on to say, but it is the light which shines in the fresh unfolding of truth that glorifies the old. He who rejects, hello, or neglects the new does not really possess the old. One more time. He who rejects or neglects the new does not really possess the old. For him, it loses its vital power and becomes but a lifeless form. Christ Object Lessons, page 127. When I got involved in the Adventist church, I didn't sign up for a cult, I signed up for a movement. This church was always supposed to be about progressing with the new light that it was given. But somehow we got stopped up at the Sabbath. And I, I don't know if we think the spirit of prophecy died, but we got stuck somewhere and we stopped moving. But Adventism was always supposed to be a movement. This church, this remnant body, and hello, the book of Ezra is all about a remnant who have come back. This church, this remnant body was all, what distinguishes our church is that we keep moving with the lamb. We keep moving with the new progression of God's revealing light. And it's not new light in the sense that it's brand spanking new, it's built on the old. But if you can't accept the new, you never had the old. You never had the old. And so this is why God jumps in. And we, under, we, we ask ourselves, why didn't this reformation work? Why didn't this revival happen? Why didn't fire fall from the sky? Why didn't the glory come down? Everybody's weeping, everybody's crying. Nobody understands, nobody gets it. But in the first chapter and the first book, first chapter and the first verse of Ezra, the Bible says all these things happened in fulfillment of the prophecy that was given to Jeremiah. And the prophecy that was given to Jeremiah is in those three, three chapters in the center of the book of Jeremiah that say these things. It says these words. Then, after those days, this is after you've come up out of the land of Babylon. Then in those days, I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them up out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was like a husband to them. This is God saying, I'm done. This thing is a wrap. He's like, I, listen, God doesn't use this language often in scripture, but God jumps out 200 years later, 200 years previous to this moment, he jumps out and says, I hate your feasts. I hate your festivals. I hate your Sabbath days. I hate your circumcision because injustice is happening in the streets and you wanna stand here and come up into church and have worship and clap your hands and desolation is out there in the community. God's like, away from me. He says these words, he says, your worship and your praise is a stench in my nostrils. It stinks. I've never heard God speak, so, and in the Hebrew, the language is so strong, brothers and sisters. God's like, I am done. I'm so done with y'all. It's done, it's a wrap. We're not going back to this thing. We're not doing business as usual because it didn't work then. And here's the thing, in the book of Ezra, these people, they erected the, um, the, the temple of the Lord, they built the temple of the Lord, they reestablished the Torah, they restored the walls of Jerusalem, and 80 years later, they were back in their sin back in the same sin that got them into exile. Because these outward things, they don't keep you. That's why Paul says the law is weakened by the flesh. This law is a ministry of death. That's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3. It's a ministry of death. All it can do is point you to your destruction and your demise because of your sin. And so God's like, I'm done with that, it's over. We're not going back to new moon festivals. We're not going back to the days of our pioneers. We're not going back to Eden. It's, more, it's, it's never happening. I'm doing a new thing. And this is the danger, y'all, in trying to look at the past to determine what's gonna happen in the present. And listen, y'all know this, because in some of your relationships, you can't move forward because you're, con you're, you're comparing them to the person and the light and the joy of your past. 
Some of you guys can't get on with your lives because you're like, but he didn't do it that way. She didn't do it that way. And God's like, I am doing a brand new thing. It's not gonna have anything to do with a city with walls or reestablishing the law or rebuilding these temples where you bring in the goats and the sheeps and the ducks and the bulls and the cows and all of it still you go off and you leave and you do the same sin that you came in here to cover. God's like, I'm done. I hate it. Stop it. I'm done. God was moving the agenda along. This was new light for the people of God. And they had a hard time with it. They had a difficult time with it because it didn't look like the way it did back at Sinai. It didn't look like the way it did back in Solomon's day. It didn't line up, but God's like, don't put me in a box. I'm about to do something brand new and every ear will tingle. It's gonna look so different. It's not gonna walk like you, talk like you, smell like you, but my spirit's gonna be in it. God, help us. Help us, God. This is why we can have a week of release and revival, and you can come down and you can bawl your eyes out at the altar. You can weep and cry and you can get the oil and you can have hands laid on you and you can run outside this church and still act like a devil. You can do that. You can do that. Here's the reason why, because God's like, I am trying to put this thing inside of you. I'm trying to get inside of you. He's like, I am done with the tents. I am done with the tabernacles. I am done with the temples. I'm trying to get on the inside. The plan was always the human heart. God's like, I'm done cleaning every, never mind cleaning the sanctuary in heaven. That's one thing that's happening, but God is trying to cleanse the sanctuary of your heart. He's like, I'm trying to get on the inside of you. Let me in, let me in, let me in. And we just, we, we resist. Because here's the thing, the human heart is the only door in the universe that locks from the inside. Jesus has the keys to, to Hades and to hell and to death and to the grave. He's got the keys to heaven. He's got the keys to the church, but he does not have the key to your heart. That is the one door that you can refuse to open. And that's the only thing God's looking for. He's like, the only real estate I'm interested in buying is your heart. That's it. That is it. And God is saying, let me in, let me in. You, you can't do this thing on your own. And you say, pastor, okay, but how? That's the great mystery. How does God, this big, great God, this divine being get inside of broken humanity? And it is the agency and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's all. That is the marker of the remnant church in the last days. I'm sorry to tell you, it's not just going to be the Sabbath. You can get this out every day of your life. You cannot eat pork every day of your life and still be lost. You can be a vegan and still be lost. You can come to church every day, every day, not even just on Sabbath, but every day of the week and still be lost. Because God's like, you can't go to heaven with this junk. Not this inside of you. Come, let me come in. Let me clean it. Let me sanctify it. Let me purify it. Let me wash you. Let me make you clean. Let me make you whole. But we lock the door to Jesus. We lock the door to him. The only one who can really deliver us. I know there's some basketball players up in here. But maybe the reason why you don't pass the ball is because there's some insecurity issues that only Jesus can fix. I know there's some leaders in here that haven't been able to find their voice in the, the places that they work, and maybe it's because you won't let Christ into fix and attack the fear that's in your heart. I know some of you guys just have no self-control. I mean, none, no self-control. Not when it comes to sex, not when it comes to anger, not when it comes to finances, no self-control. And it's because there's broken people living inside. A broken, orphaned little boy, little girl, that is locked up in your heart that you will not let Jesus into because, and here's the reality, because some of that stuff is so scary that we're afraid that if we, and I'm speaking to myself, there were, I, I mean, I went for about a year and a half, I didn't talk about the passing of my mother, I just didn't talk about it because I was so afraid to open that, not to God, not to anybody, because I was so afraid that if I opened that door, I didn't know what would come out. There are voicemails from my mom still on my phone, 2018, going to 2019 she passed last year that I still have not listened to. Because I don't know what's gonna happen if I play that and I hear her voice. I, 
and I refuse to talk to God about it because I'm still not sure what happened because I was praying. I was a praying person back then. I'm still praying, but I was a praying person for my mother and I'm not sure, but I can't even open that door because I'm not sure what's gonna, I'm not sure if I'm gonna lose my faith. I'm not gonna sure if I'm gonna lose my mind. I'm not sure if I'm gonna lose my heart. I just don't know. And there's a fear that keeps this door locked. And we all have stuff like that in here. We all have stuff like that. We all have stuff like that. Like the mean-spirited, the mean-spirited stuff that we do to one another. The heartless words, careless words that we do to one another, say to one another, that we smile in each other's faces, happy Sabbath, and we go behind each other's back, or we steal each other, we steal someone's spouse, like as if that's not doing violence to your sister in this community, as if, as if that's not doing violence to your brother in this community. You know, or we, we sleep around, we use our influences and our good looks and our good charm and all of that, and we take advantage of one another, abuse one another, or you, you lay hands on your spouse in your home, how dare you? How dare you? And all of this is because God is not in us. He's just not, there's only one answer to this problem. It's not like we're troubleshooting, trying to figure out where, would, where do we go wrong, God? We just don't understand where we're No, there's no spirit inside of you. There's no God inside of you. And you, you all just hear me. This is the word for today. It's not a complicated word. It's a simple word. God says this, look, look, Jesus says these words. He says, he says, he says, look, in Matthew and Luke, in Luke 11, 13, he says, if you being evil, because this is the answer to the problem, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father give you the Holy Spirit if you ask? If you ask. Solution is so simple. Aren't you tired of being bitter, man? Aren't you tired of being just bitter, always being in a bad mood, resenting people? like angry, just on sight. You see someone, they just trigger you, aren't you? I mean, I, the, whole, the whole point is that, that self is so crucified in us because the Holy Spirit is attacking things, just tearing things down that you have nothing in me to trigger me because Christ has, has squashed that stuff. Like that's the freedom that we're looking for. Ultimately, spirit dwelling in us is all about being set free from our insecurities, from our fear, from our anger, from our bitterness, from our resentment, from our unforgiveness, from our adultery, from our lust, from our fornication, from our covetousness. It's about being set free from all of that stuff. And that's what he wants to give you. And only you can unlock that door, man. Only you can unlock that door. I want revival. I want reformation. But this is why it fails. Because here's the thing. The signs change. The, 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 the venue changes. The context changes. The speakers change. The, 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 um, the, the, the venue changes. But the only thing that remains the same and unchanged and untransformed is the human heart. It's a human heart. This is why all of our evangelistic series, they result in people acting the same way maybe a week, maybe a day, an hour later. Back on their phones, text them, looking for booty. <laughs> no, no, but I'm, I'm not being funny, I'm being real. And snared again, entangled again, in seconds, in an hour. And I'm talking to myself too, because I'm yelling at administration, going like, why can't you guys get it together at the GC? Like, I'm sorry, but I am, I'm yelling at them in my heart. I am. But it's like, but revival happens at the local level among the people. It happens here. There are so many broken, fractured relationships here. We can't even come together on one purpose to stand on one accord for one vote, for one decision, for one idea. Because the heart has not been cleansed. But the call this morning is for you to bring your dirt and your baggage down here and let Jesus deal with it. Please let Jesus deal with it. I'm here too. I'm the first one here. Jesus says these words, Revelation 3, 20, he says, I stand at the door and I knock. If you answer, I will come in and have supper with you. Any of you, he stands at the door and he knocks. My young people, he stands at the door and he knocks. And if you open, he will come in and eat with you, he will commune with you. You can have all your mess there, but he will commune with you still. He's like, Let, let's wrap, let's, let's wrap still. Like, it's a mess in here, but let's wrap. 
but let him come in with his lantern to light up the filth in there that you've become accustomed to living with and let him clean the junk out. John 14 verse 23 says this thing. He says, then I and the Father will come and we will make our home with you. God, I want you to make your home in me. I want you to make your home in me, God. The place where you take off your shoes and you relax. The place where you kick back and you chill. The place where you feel at rest, where you feel at peace is in the human heart, the human soul. My heart and my soul belong to you, Lord. My heart and my soul belong to you, Lord. We just sang that. So many marriages would be, <laughs> would be restored if you could just let Jesus into your heart, your junk. And in here, <laughs> we're the generation that will we'll post everything on social media, everything will be on Facebook, everything will be on Instagram. I love the gram. Everything will be on Twitter because we, give our to we want our total audience to be everybody else but God. But we'll never go in prayer and open up our heart and say, here it is, God. Here's the ugly, here's all of it. Please cleanse it, please. That's what he's looking for. And all we have to do is ask. And here's the thing, the knocking on the door, yes, it pertains to salvation, that moment of salvation, but it continues on in the Christian life. Sometimes God will have to knock six or seven times but he doesn't have the key, you have to unlock that door because he's not gonna heal you against your will. And that's the hard thing about this. Are you really open to transformation and healing and restoration and renewal? I, I don't know, I am. So our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I'm the first one here. Abba, I want you to put your Holy Spirit in me and I want you to clean my heart. Anybody want to join me, just come down. I don't care if you just stopped in town to visit, I don't care if you're traveling, if you're, you just, you know, this is a moment between you and God. These things don't always happen, these opportunities don't always present themselves. Bless God, thank you Oakwood. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, it's a personal moment. You know you need to get up, you need to come down, you make your way down. How many opportunities do you get to really ask God to come in and really clean and fix heart and, and restore and renew and cleanse? And stop making it so cerebral and theological about the sanctuary in heaven and start focusing on the sanctuary of the human heart. I'm just gonna wait. I'm not gonna keep speaking, but I'm gonna wait in silence and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. God, I know there's more people. I don't know why I don't see the whole church standing, but maybe that's because you figured out another way to clean your heart and to have the Holy Spirit in you. I don't know. coming bless God still coming I will wait for you still standing it's okay don't move under my unctioning wait for the spirit to prick your heart that's how conviction works the spirit speaks you act, that's conviction, and over time it becomes not second nature, but first nature. Just responsive obedience, and that leads to freedom. That's what it means to be free, is to be fully obedient, because that's what freedom looks like. Looks like an obedient life. somebody beside you let's pray Abba I don't even know the words this morning to pray um, but Abba you you are so good yes, Jesus. 
Like you are such a loving father. I, I, I don't have the right words to talk about how great you are. I'd have to borrow from King David or King Solomon and just say, your love endures forever, God. And you are a majestic king and you are my rock and you are my refuge and you are my strong tower. And then in Revelation, it talks about you being alpha and being omega, God, but you're also everything in between. And then in the New Testament, it says you are the way and you're the truth and you're the life, God, and you are, you are high. I, God, but you sit low and you're a king and you're a warrior and you're a savior and God, yet you're also the scape, God, you are the lamb, you are, you are all these things, Lord, and you fit into every area of our heart and every area of our mind, Lord, you, you are this big majestic God and th this is the mystery, Lord, that we're baffled with is that this big awesome God, um, this big wonderful king somehow desires to, to sit amongst rubbish and to sit amongst garbage and to, to dwell, God. When you could dwell in your heavenly court, God, and you could dwell around a myriad of angels, Jesus, when you choose our hearts, you choose our hearts, God, when you say our hearts are deceitfully wicked, desperately sick, God, but you choose our hearts. I'm so glad that I don't have to be perfect to come to you, but I can just come as I am a hot flaming mess, God, and just say, come on in, Jesus. Lord, this morning you're saying, let me in. Just let me in, just let me in. And watch what I'll do. I'm not gonna take away all your fun. I'm not gonna take away all your joy. I'm not a boring God. What I wanna do is elevate it and upgrade it and, and, and develop it further. And all this happens through the power and the agency of the Holy Spirit. So God, your word says that if we being evil, if we being wicked, you know, we know how to give good gifts to our children, God. We know how to do good to our children even though we are adulterers and liars and gossips and thieves and drunkards, God, and addicts. Even though we know how to do good, how much more good do you, our Heavenly Father, know how to do? And so God, we just ask you, your children ask you this morning for the gift of your Holy Spirit. I pray that a revival would be traced back to Brinkle that would affect the nations, God. Because of this moment, Jesus, for all that are standing here that are in need of you, Lord, in need of your healing, if we've lost loved ones, if we've done something wrong but don't know how to make it right, if we need to make restitution but don't know how, if we're in um, a sinful situation, God, and ensnared and entrapped and entangled, if we don't know how to stop texting or stop going online and looking for things that only you can satisfy, God, bring it to our minds right now. Help us to know that the only freedom and deliverance only comes through the Spirit and through you, Jesus. Convict our hearts with that right now, God. And so God, we unlock the door from the inside this morning and we just say, I don't know what you're gonna see in there and I don't know how it's gonna impact me or how much it's gonna hurt, but we trust you, God, the only one who's ever always been good to us and cared for us and watched over us. Your resume is great, so there's no reason why we can't trust you, God. So we trust you in this moment and we say, come into our hearts come into our souls, stain our hearts and our souls with your love, with your power, with your mercy, with what you did on Calvary. May that be ever before us, God. May your love just be wrapped around us, your arms just be wrapped around us, your mercy and your grace be all over us in this moment. Remove insecurity, remove fear, remove doubt, God. Remove angst, remove anxiety, remove uh, restlessness, God. Remove fear, remove issues of rejection from our childhood, God peel back the layers on secrets that we have kept for far too long, God, and that are festering, and begin to do an awesome work. Cleanse our hearts, God. And God, don't let us be like that house <laughs> where the evil spirit is cast out, and then it wanders into dry desert places, looks for a few of its homies that are more evil than he or she, and then it returns back to these people, God, or to me. And it fills that house because it's unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. And they set up shop there and the state of who we are, God, is worse off than when we first began, Jesus. So uh, that's my prayer, Lord. And I just trust you to do it. And when we see all these awesome things in our life take place and all this newness being birthed, God, 
would we be able and would we be willing to give you the praise and the honor and the glory for we ask all these names all these things in the strong name of Jesus Christ and the people of God said amen 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 Created me a clean heart and purify me. Purify me. Purify me. Created me a clean heart so I may worship thee. Cast me not away from thy presence. Please don't take church say amen again. If you are grateful for the Word of God and what the Word of God did for you, why don't you put your hands together in gratitude God's Word. Pastor Smith, thank you for allowing the Lord to use you in a mighty and unique way. And I will ask you to join me in prayer and support for Pastor Smith. We, we believe God has his hands on her. So would you do that? Would you make, uh, make prayer a priority for her? Would you do that for me? And uh, when you approach her, will you only approach her with God's blessings and goodness? Will you do that for me? the short time she has been with us, she has been under attack and began to share some of the things. Once she was given a Bible study in the home, while she was given a Bible study, a tree fell on the home. Uh, do you hear me? Um, the devil's trying to interrupt her, but we believe that greater is he that's in her he that's in the world. So I'm asking you that for a specific purpose. These aren't empty words. Uh, they really are not. I'm asking you to keep her in prayer. Surround her with positivity. And if you see or hear of anything else, rebuke that in the name of Jesus. So we praise God, we praise God for her. And um, I'm glad that God in his goodness brought her to Emmanuel Brinklow for this purpose. Now, let me be clear, let me be clear. The Lord has blessed this church with speakers. It's been great spiritual entertainment. But if the hearts aren't changed, that's all it is. You get a chance to check off and critique and evaluate and say how far they're going and what they're doing, but it really is about your hearts. And if the transformation is not taking place then, then you have just been spiritually entertained again. Amen. God doesn't send messengers just to entertain us. So thank you for reminding of that, of that today. Thank you for allowing the Lord to use you in your own style. Amen. Let me be clear. My task as her senior pastor is not to make her like me. I don't want her to conform to my way. I want her to be all that God wants her to be. So she kicks off her shoes and wears jeans with holes in them to preach. That's how God uses her. Amen. The only conformity is for all of us, individually and collectively.
The only conformity that God asks us all is to conform to his image. And he determines what that looks like, not us. So when Pastor Esmond comes with his eloquence, that's God using him. When Dr. Brown comes with his intellect, that's God using him. That's how we allow the Holy Spirit to work here. Is that okay? So we were blessed today. Thank you, Pastor Smith, for allowing me to come back into worship. Did, did Doc McCoy, was he? Did, you, did he say something? We're glad to, that, that's family. That's, that's, we good. The reason why we have the regional retirement plan for all the regional conferences is because of that man right there. Joe McCoy, Joe McCoy proved that you can, get this, oh this is big, proved that you can go against the status quo of the general conference and establish something that is good for your own people. And Elder Joe McCoy paid a price so that the best retirement plan and the Adventist community and all around the world is in the regional conferences because of him. Amen, somebody. Praise God for you. Praise God for you. Uh, you know, I like talking about that. That's good news. Don't tell me we gotta follow status quo. If you have the right leadership, who are willing to sacrifice, who do their homework, who stand for the right, though the heavens fall, change will happen. And that's a living example of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Sister Wright, I, th I thought you didn't go to Florida Tuesday? Okay, I still got the offer to carry your bags if you want me to, want me to go with you. Praise God for you. Uh, Pastor, you have there's somebody we missed that you want to acknowledge. He was anchoring it down. Let me sit down so you can finish anchoring today. I, I feel better with my senior pastors in this church. Amen. He didn't tell you what he was doing today, but he was on a mission building bridges. You'll hear about more about that. Always appreciate him. Um, just one little, I, I, I didn't forget, I just saved the best for last. In this congregation is my favorite Bible worker in the whole world. Not only is she a Bible worker, but she teaches Bible workers. Um, in this congregation is the conduit of my greatest blessing, my wife. Her mother is here. I'm going to ask Dr. Gloria Bell if she would stand. One of the employees at Oakwood University. And she tells me that I'm her favorite, number one, most beloved son-in-law in the whole world. And that's because I'm the only one, but we don't talk about that. We don't talk about that. But I thank God, I thank God for her. Pastor, come on. Since, since we're acknowledging, I have to, many of you will remember uh, Ed Woods II. He was the president of the National Alumni Association for many years from the Benton Harbor area, very distinguished man, educator, worker for the church and so forth, who we know we lost. Well, his, his bride, his wife is here, Edith, with us today, and we want Edith to know how much we love her. We're family to her, Edith and Trish and Brian, Gina, they're all here, and we just praise God for her, and we want you to know that, um, man, if we still had him at the helms, what a different things would be right now. What a powerful man he was, powerful educator, committed to Oakwood College and University for his years of service for the Lake Region Conference, Lake Region Union, and for all that he has done. So. He is waiting for the call of Jesus to come right down. So, Edith, we welcome you. Okay, who's closing out? Who's giving benediction? You? Sound like you. Whoever points is the one who's giving it. Praise him, amen. That's all stand for the benediction if we can. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, we were blessed this morning. And we want to thank you for that blessing. And Father, let that blessing be used in us and through us today, tomorrow, and forever. Now, Father, as we go our separate ways, be with us, keep us until we meet again. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
Praise the 